Uh, you've noticed that Trump supporters, Republicans in general, are often referred to as low information voters. You've heard that, right? That Trump supporters are low information voters. But here's a test I want you to give yourself when you're talking with other people. I, I find this to be consistently true. And, and I'll give you a few examples. I was talking to uh, someone who didn't identify as an anti-Trumper, but in the context, it was obvious. So I said, well, take, um, take for example, um, Charlottesville. Um, and I was explaining how it was reported that the president said both sides were good, were fine people. And it was reported that he meant that included um, the white supremacists were fine people. And I said to him, well, you know, that's just not what happened. What actually happened is the president said there were fine people on both sides of the statue question, because the whole event was around the statue. Do you keep the Confederate statue or do you not? And so when I told him this, it was clearly the first time he had ever heard that interpretation. Now, forget about whether he agreed with it or disagreed with it. It was the first time he had heard that interpretation. How many of you had never heard that interpretation before, that both sides was clearly and obviously about both sides of the statue thing, because the alternative explanation that the news has presented to you, the anti-Trump news, is that the President of the United States consciously and intentionally sided with white supremacists on the same week they killed somebody. That didn't happen. <laughs> it would be crazy to think that happened. And then further, after having done, in their telling of the event, Further, after having done something that crazy, like a day later or whatever it was, a few days later, I don't remember, he clarified that he does not support white supremacists just as he has clarified 55 times in the past or whatever the number is. Now, that's a crazy interpretation. My interpretation, that he, as the president, he was saying, hey, let's all calm down. Let's, let's agree that bad behavior is bad behavior no matter what and they're both there are good sides there are good people on both sides of the statue question not both sides meaning white supremacists my interpretation is completely normal and consistent with the facts now we don't have to agree who's right my point is he had never heard that interpretation but you've heard both interpretations right so wouldn't that, wouldn't that make you the high information voter in this case? Um, let me give you another one. I, the same person, and I was talking about the accusation that the president made fun of Serge Kowalski, I can't remember his name, the reporter who had the, the genetic problem with his arm. And I said, you've probably seen the video that it was reported as fact that the president was making fun of somebody's bad arm. And I said, but have you seen all the videos in context where he makes the same or similar hand motions about other people? And it's just the way he makes fun of dumb people. And he had not. How many of you have seen the videos showing that he often does that same gesture and it's not about people with bad arms? Probably most of you. Wouldn't you say? I'll bet most of you have seen that. He had not. So I had seen his point of view, and I've seen my own point of view and your point of view, but he had only seen his own point of view, ever. Not once had he ever seen what I described that I've seen lots of times. So which one of us was the low information voter? All right, let me give you another one. Uh, talking about the kids in cages and Trump put, put kids in cages and that topic came up and I I mentioned, you know, but of course that was also happening during Obama. You could almost see his face reboot. Yeah, I've talked about this before 
when cognitive dissonance hits in, there's a very um, there's an obvious facial bodily change where the person just goes, Ooh. you know, it's all it's almost like you could see a, a, a almost like the brain is rebooting, and so I said, yeah, Trump put more people in cages than Obama did, but Obama was putting kids in cages as well. It was the first time he'd considered that. Now, I couldn't tell if he'd never heard it, but he'd never considered it as a, a important part of the story. And then I further explained, and you know that, you know, treating the, the refugees um, in the most humane way creates more refugees, right? And I said, you know that, right? That you would be increasing the number of refugees. And he hadn't really considered that. And then I, then I said, and you know that the thinking is that if you have fewer refugees in the long run, that means that there might be fewer children who are raped. But the trade-off was you're, you're having less child trafficking, less fewer children getting killed. And let's say, and here's how I framed it. I said, in the Trump administration, if you took a hundred, uh, let's say just any hundred kids, the trade-off was putting a hundred kids separated from their parents, which, here we'll get rid of my troll, um, putting a hundred kids in cages, which would have, I, I said, it would have psychological effects. Some of them would be bad and that that's a bad situation. So I agreed with him that any kids in cages is just always a bad situation. It doesn't matter how they got there, right? But I said the alternative and the only alternative that anybody could think of was one in which more kids got raped and trafficked and killed. So I said, yes, it was a conscious decision that you know, having this impact on, say, 100 kids put in cages helped two or three of them not be raped and killed and that that was a conscious trade-off. The person I was talking to had never heard it framed that way, had never heard that those were the two choices because the other choice, which he sort of imagined was the good one, is that you just let the families and the kids stay together, which meant releasing them because there weren't any facilities. And I said, you realize that that would increase the amount of trafficking and that, and that your preferred solution would in fact have fewer kids in cages, and that's good, but at the expense of two or three out of a hundred maybe getting killed or raped. And I said, did you know that that was a trade-off and he did not. He had not thought of it in those terms. And he said he'd be open to listening to, you know, maybe statistics that would that would back that up. But that's the argument. Now I too, I too would like to hear statistics that back that up. And I could easily be wrong. It could be that the number is zero. Zero people would be raped. I don't know. Well, I'm no expert on the situation. But here's the point. I knew his argument, but he had never heard, had never heard my argument, which is largely the same as your argument, I'm sure. So you can kind of go down the line, I think. You can go down the line and you would find that the conservatives are completely aware of the argument on the left. Wouldn't you say that's true? Fact check me on this. I mean, as much as much as you can, because these are uh, this is anecdotal. But fact check me. Isn't it true that the right knows the arguments on the left, and they also know their own arguments? Wouldn't you say that's true? But I'm finding that um, it is massively true that the people on the left have never even heard the argument on the other side. And when was the last time you heard some, have you ever, have you ever heard anybody tell you what I just told you? Have you ever even heard anybody explain it? And, and now keep your eyes open and see if it feels true to you. 
that every time you see one of these big controversial situations, you do know what their argument is. You could disagree with it. You probably do. But you certainly know what the argument is. They don't even know what the argument is on the other side. What's up with that?